Honorable Minister, uh, first of all, thank you for honoring your invitation and being here with us. It's a great privilege. I think uh, we are making this a conversation, so with your permission, I'll carry on talking sitting. So, <clears throat> first, I think the aviation sector under your leadership has been able to recover fully from the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think we are more than 11% over the pre-COVID times from a traffic point of view. Most importantly, I think aviation as a sector has emerged as the fastest growing in the last three years. So congratulations on that, sir. I think we do very much welcome and support the investor-friendly initiatives which you have taken, and especially the convergence of the civil and defense sectors, and making sure as an aerospace industry we have an opportunity to grow is something which we are very proud of. I think we have received immense support and guidance. We have worked on various initiatives, including on the upper air mobility, which we did on 28th. So thank you very much for that. So without uh, much time, I will straight away start with a few, uh, the first question. So first, what is your vision? And how do you look at the transformation of air travel and transport in what we would call as the Amrit Kal of India, sir? So first of all, congratulations, Dineshji, and uh, thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be at uh, the CIF Forum. Um, let me start by saying this, that I think that uh, we are on the cusp of uh, a fundamental change as far as uh, civil aviation uh, is concerned. Uh, every industry um, uh, across the world, uh, in its vertical uh, goes through its stage of infancy, growth, and maturity. And I believe that the civil aviation uh, sector in India is just about on its takeoff stage uh, uh, as far as its uh, growth phase is concerned. Now, if you look at the numbers over the last uh, four to five years, uh, the civil aviation sector has uh, uh, had a compounded annual growth rate uh, of close to about 10.6%. Uh, in 2013-14, we had uh, roughly about 6 crore passengers domestically. Uh, in the last uh, 8 to 9 years, uh, that figure has grown to 14.4 uh, crores uh, at last count. Um, we've assumed uh, uh, post-COVID, as you very uh, articulately mentioned, we have emerged uh, if you will, uh, in terms of a V-shaped recovery post-COVID, uh, where we had at one point of time all our planes sitting on the ground with no passengers, uh, not even idling. Uh, today, we do not have enough planes up in the air uh, to fly the number of passengers that we, that we would like to uh, in our country. Um, Pre-COVID, we had a high of roughly about uh, 4,20,000 passengers per day. Uh, we've crested that repeatedly uh, in the last three months both in-season and off-season, uh, which tells us that the uh, winter season and the festival season that is about to come uh, ha holds a much greater portent in terms of uh, a greater demand for civil aviation. So what does that mean? That means that on the one side, we've got to make sure that our airports ramp up capacity. And we've got a very, very uh, expansive CapEx plan in place uh, in 2013-14, we had 74 airports, water drones, and heliports in our country. In a period of nine years under the leadership of the Prime Minister, we've doubled that number to 148 today. Uh, I'm going to Kanpur tomorrow, uh, day after tomorrow, to inaugurate the new facility in Kanpur, which is a roughly about 14 times its original size. So therefore, capacity building uh, is what is on the anvil as far as civil aviation is concerned. Today, if you look at our six metros, we've got roughly a capacity of uh, throughput capability of 220 million passengers. We're going to more than double that in the next five years. Six metros in India will have a throughput capacity of greater than 416 million passengers in the next three to four years. So that's the kind of growth phase we're looking at in terms of airports. Similarly, as far as uh, uh, airlines and planes are concerned, We've all heard of the, air, air, uh, the huge order put in by Air India of 470 aircraft, uh, close to 220 uh, with my friend on my left, 
uh, and uh, 250 with his arch rifle, uh, which is Airbus. Uh, now that, uh, uh, for India, uh, and not only for India, but internationally, is the largest order ever placed in civil aviation history, which has happened from India. And the point I want to make here, Dinesh Ji, is that we looked at an Air India, an Air India that was crippled, an Air India that was hemorrhaging, an Air India that was posting losses greater than 600 crores a month on a sequential basis, 7,200 crores of in the red of taxpayers' money. And it's not only government of India's money, it's your money. And look at how that story has turned around with the one initiative that the Prime Minister has taken to ensure the successful divestment of Air India. Today you have that same company that was bleeding 7,200 crores of taxpayers' money, putting the largest order in civil aviation history in the world on the world stage with 470. That's the kind of change that we have seen happen in civil aviation. And I'm very confident that very clearly shows that my time is up as far as this answer is concerned. Uh, uh, but that very clearly shows the potential for civil aviation in the days to come. And the last point I want to make is that it's not only about metro to metro connectivity. It's all about, it's also about last mile connectivity where I'm putting a huge thrust. Because the one thing that the Prime Minister has done which has changed the face of civil aviation in this country in the last nine years is really democratize civil aviation. And Ode Desh Ka Aam Nagrik, the program that has resulted in tier two, tier three passengers coming, city passengers coming to tier one passengers and even traveling abroad. That regional connectivity and last mile connectivity must exceed its pace in terms of penetration. And that's one of the things we're looking at with even sub 20 seater aircraft. So it's not good enough having Boeing aircraft or Airbus aircraft in terms of narrow bodied or wide bodied. It's as important to have helicopters, to have seaplanes, to have sub 20 seater aircrafts that take people to the last mile and connect them to the last mile. Which is why Uran in 4.2 looked only at small aircrafts in terms of connectivity. And the next phase that I'm going to come out with, which is after Uran 5.0, which is going to be Uran 5.1, is again looking at small aircraft connectivity. Because if you are providing that last mile connectivity, then you're going to have a seamless connectivity from tier three cities to tier one cities to people even going abroad. And that's what our goal is. Thank, thank you, sir. I mean, wonderfully put. And as always, uh, you put it in very simple terms for all of us to be able to understand. But if I can just step back and look at it and say, what do you think are the challenges we will face? And how do you think we can overcome them, not just from the I would call it operating infrastructure, but also from the management of the, such a large growth in passenger volumes which you are expecting in the future. So the first thing that we have to do is to make sure that uh, our view, whether you're an airline, whether you're an airport, or whether you're government of India, our view is that of a service-oriented business towards our customers. It has to be a customer-centric point of view. And therefore, I believe our role in government today as a ministry is also not to be a, that one of a regulator, but to be of a facilitator. And therefore, to get all stakeholders on board, make sure that you resolve their pain points, because in resolution of their pain points and making sure that a facilitatory environment is created for them to grow, lies the growth of India and lies the growth of civil aviation. And so that has been our motive and our resolve over the last two, two and a half years, whether it's looking at airlines, whether it's looking at airports, whether it's looking at MROs or FTOs, we've scrapped a number of rules, made it much simpler, much easier, got rid of royalty payments, got rid of exacerbated rental uh, payments to make sure that it's a service-led organization. We've sat with airlines, uh, and one of the things that I was made aware of is that not only has the price of ATF, for example, uh, gone up by almost 2x, it used to be 53,000 rupees a kiloliter pre-COVID, it's now close to a lakh and 7,000 rupees a kiloliter, but that constitutes close to about 40% of the cost structure of an airline. And therefore, if 40% of your cost structure has actually doubled, 
then that immediately hits everything that's going below the bottom line. And so the bottom line that was in the black will turn straight away into the red. And so one of the things that we looked at immediately was to look at states and imploring states, bring them on board to ensure they reduce VAT on air turbine fuel. And I was very surprised to learn that there was a number of states that were charging between 20 to 30 percent VAT on ATF. Now imagine this, your ATF price doubles, then you have a double whammy in terms of the VAT on ATF being 20 to 30 percent of that base price. And therefore that cripples airlines in multiple ways. And so therefore a scenario in 2021 where we had only 12 states that charged between 1 to 4 percent VAT on ATF and almost close to about 24 states and union territories that charge between 20 to 30 percent. By employing states and through your forum, I'd like to thank all the state governments, the chief ministers, who've actually facilitated this. And we've brought 19 states from that basket of 24 states of 20 to 30 percent VAT to 1 to 4 percent VAT. And so therefore in India today you have 31 states that charge only between 1 to 4 percent. And only five now, and I'm using that term meaningly, outlier states that charge between 20 to 30 percent VAT. And through your forum again, I'd like to implore them to come on board because the multipliers of aviation are phenomenal. There was a time 20, 30 years ago when airports and connectivity was only based on industrially prominent cities or tourism prominent cities. Today that notion has turned on its head. Where you have an airport and where you have airline connectivity is where industrialists flock to and tourists flock to. And therefore for state governments as well, it's imperative to grow their number of airports, to grow the number of airline connectivity because the dividend that civil aviation brings with it, both in terms of an economic multiplier, which is a 3.1 economic multiplier in terms of economic growth, and 6.1 employment multiplier, direct to indirect. So the benefits are tremendous. And therefore, civil aviation today has become the foundation and basis of economic growth across the length and breadth of our country. Thank you, sir. Uh, my last question. So if you look at uh, how digitization has overtaken uh, different sectors and how you look at that actually impacting uh, whether it's the uh, passenger movement or the goods movement across the various airports and uh, connection between the airlines. How do you see that progressing going forward? Do you see India taking the lead? I mean, how do you see us kind of positioning ourselves, both from for the utilization of the infrastructure as well as the facilitation of people and goods movement? Well, I think we've already taken the lead. The Prime Minister has been very clear that uh, when you see an opportunity, and when you see nascency, your vision and your dream must be that India should be the leader in that sector. And let me give you two examples in Asia. The first is the area of drones, an area which had been not explored until today. And through government initiatives, and I firmly believe that there are three tripods on the basis of which a new idea can actually proliferate. The first is you've got to have very sensible policy. And that's why we went back to the drawing board in terms of the drone rules. The multiplicity of permissions, the number of fees, we just scrapped the whole lot of them and came out with a very simple facilitatory system. I had promised that within one month we'll come out with an airspace map. A very difficult exercise because you can imagine You've got to coordinate with central government ministries, defense, many other institutional areas, power, so on and so forth. You've got to coordinate with state governments as to which are the sensitive areas within those states. But within one month, we came out with an airspace map, which is probably better than even the United States of America and Canada, because close to about 90% of our areas are green zones. The second tripod is to make sure that you put in place a scheme that will give a fillip to this area. And so we came out of the PLI scheme for drones. 
and an industry that was in its nascency of close to about 60 odd crores, our PLI scheme over a period of three years for both drone manuf parts manufacturing, drone manufacturing and services constituted a budgetary outlay of close to about 120 crores, double the size of an industry. And in the last one year, through the PLI scheme, we have dispersed almost 30 crores in the first year to multiple companies. The third tripod is actually demand creation. Because you may have a great product, you may have great incentive, but unless there's a market out there, you can't sell it. And so government actually went out on a limb to create that market and that demand. Twelve ministries from the central government, the health ministry, ministry of rural development doing the cadastral surveys completely by drone, health ministry, vaccine delivery by drones, mining ministry in terms of the dangerous areas doing that job with drones across multiple verticals, mandatorily put in place rules that drones will be used for the following functions and therefore the creation of demand. And so government has gone that extra mile. The second example is probably, hopefully, people such as yourselves and, and people sitting in this hall have started to use, which is Digi Yatra. We started with Delhi, Varanasi and Bengaluru. Uh, and the very fact that today when you enter an airport through facial recognition technology, FRT, from when you enter an airport to when you board your plane, between 9 to 15 minutes flat, the process has been made completely facilitatory just through FRT process. So therefore, multiple ID checks, multiple processes, all having been obliterated. And to be able to service customers, we have a separate Digi Yatra line, which is separate from the other passengers. So those that use Digi Yatra just sail through. And therefore, you download DigiLocker app, you download the DigiAthra app, and you're all set to go on your next flight. Thank you, sir. So I'm now going to request uh, Salil to give his quick comment and then come back with uh, maybe your feedback on that as well. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, Honorable Minister, thank you for joining us. I think as most people who know me uh, in this room know that I'm going to try not to dwell at a very high level. I'm going to give a couple of relatively specific strategies on ecosystem and on manufacturing. And I'd love to have the minister's feedback on those uh, because they drive what the CII Aerospace Committee and Aviation Committees will be trying to do. First of all, uh, on the ecosystem, you know, this is India's moment. This is the time for us to to turbocharge our growth with 2,200 airplanes coming into this country over the next 20 years. Now, in order to do that, we have to localize a number of things. Training, which is already in work. Parts, which is local warehouse already in work. And, of course, MRO. But here's strategy number one. We have a tendency to talk about maintenance, repair, and overhaul, MRO support for airplanes, monolithically, as if it's one thing, and it isn't. We have to focus within there to determine what India's gap is at this moment. Because for the line maintenance part of MRO, for MRO that happens at the airports every day, that's already done in India today, it has to be. For the large hangar part of MRO, what many of us think of when we think of repairing airplanes, since the tax regime was changed by this government three years ago, today, sea checks, the most common type of overhaul done in hangars, 80% of that is now happening in India, which is actually a surprising fact for most people. It's really the two parts of MRO that account for most of the spend where we're struggling. It's component MRO. So the avionics, the things that control the cockpits, electrical systems, all of those kinds of things. And engine MRO, which is the repair of the engines. That is where we need to focus. Now, thankfully, our friends at Saffron, uh, who partner to make the CFM 56 engine on both Airbus and Boeing airplanes, have announced plans to build an MRO by 2025 for engines. On components, 
we have to focus on making sure that the large foreign OEMs partner with us to set up MRO in India. But when we talk about MRO, I think we need to be very specific and focus on those two areas, engine and components, because that's where the money is, that's where the value is for the Indian airlines. On manufacturing, it's also a very stepwise approach that we have to take. It's, we tend to focus on the large, uh, the large scale manufacturing, when in fact the value is in the stepwise approach that India is taking in systems development, in large scale aerostructures, in working with composite materials. 92% of the airplane's value is actually in all of those areas where India is moving up the value curve very quickly. And so, as they move from simple assemblies to complex assemblies to complex composite manufacturing, and as they move, as Indian manufacturers move from building to a foreign OEM's blueprints to actually developing the blueprints themselves and owning the intellectual property in India, that is where the focus needs to be in manufacturing. Because again, just like with MRO, that's where the money is. So I think in both of these areas, MRO and manufacturing, from the standpoint of the CIA uh, Aerospace Committee and Civil Aviation Committees, our goal is to not talk about this at a high level anymore. We have to be specific and attack it and where the value is to follow the money. And so for that, I'd, I'd really appreciate the minister's feedback. Sorry, I mean, just in the consideration of time, oh, there is. I'm okay. going to request uh, Mr. Bhatt to also finish his comment and then I'll just take the two minutes. To give uh, actually, most of the time I want to take because we've had a lot of interactions. I must um, appreciate the Honorable Minister's exceptional response to the request from certainly airlines during the early days, especially through COVID and so on. All of that that was said about bringing, you know, fuel costs down because of the taxes in the States, everything happened. And um, thank you for that. But the problem persists. Uh, you know about it. The cumulative taxes collected uh, or rather the annual taxes collected by the government exceeds the losses that airlines make. So we do have a structural problem and I'm, I'm not even talking about in this forum about that. Just one point, uh, Honorable Minister, which is the exceptional growth that we're going to see, the 470 aircraft apart, that 1,200 or 2,200 aircraft that are going to come. This is typical of India and you have created the infrastructure but there are a lot of support services which actually lag and ends up with under servicing the marketplace. If we keep that in mind over the next few years, let's, you know, if you're going to take 1,200 pilot, uh, 1,200 aircraft, we need 12,000 to 15,000 pilots. We are at half that. It takes three to six months sometimes because of our processes. Now, these are things not right for this forum. The second point I just want to make is we are not just, we are civil aviation, but as a country, we know that the smaller countries which don't have a domestic market at all have looked at aviation along with tourism and hospitality and have clubbed the whole thing together as a huge contributor to the economy as well as jobs. I am not seeking a combination of three ministries, but I think thinking about that in the long run would be a great service to the customer who's the flyer who actually, whose aspirations are growing every day. So let me try and quickly respond to uh, both the comments uh, made by Salilji and Bhaskarji both. Uh, I think um, Salil's comment is uh, mostly on point. I think that the time has come, and this is a point that I have been pushing as well, that we set up and talk about not only airlines and airports, but we talk about the airline civil aviation ecosystem in India. And the ecosystem is much more than what meets the eye, and what meets our eye is the airport and the plane. And there's much more to the crafting of that story that's behind the curtains than what comes to meet the eye. And many of those important verticals that need to be set up in India 
our areas like MROs, our areas like flying training organizations, our areas like ground handling, our areas like manufacturing for aerospace. I see no reason why India cannot be a leader in aerospace manufacturing in India over the next 15 to 20 years. We have the market, we have the capability, we are the largest growing market in the world today. We will be a very large portion of what in 2050, according to the world uh, statistics, will be a $16 billion, $16 billion passenger market and close to about a 400 million tons cargo market. India will have a share, fair share of that pie. And therefore, the time is now to set up these verticals of the ecosystem in India. A lot has been done with regard to MROs. The taxation structure has been changed, incentivization has been done, and now we are starting to see the fruits of that. With Safran coming in with a $150 million investment, many other companies, and I would urge Boeing very quickly to look at setting up an MRO in India. It's been many a year in the waiting. Uh, it was part of many uh, conversations in the past as well. And I think it's important to put that step forward at this point of time. As far as flying training organizations are concerned, India had 35 FTOs in, in, uh, in the last two and a half years. With the dismantling of the exorbitant rental royalty system policy that was in place, today we're going to grow from 35 to 50 FTOs in India by the end of this fiscal year. So that's the kind of growth we're looking at in terms of FTOs as well. Because at the end of the day, we do not want our aspiring pilots to be going out abroad to get trained when then that same capability can be done in India. Similarly, in the area of manufacturing, there are multiple agencies and companies that have started manufacturing in India. My good friend Salil, who's sitting over here, today you have a Tata joint venture in, in Hyderabad and Bangalore that is making the fuselages of the Apache helicopters in India. The C-130 uh, uh, Hercules aircraft, the appanages of those aircraft are being made in India. I visited a Collins Aerospace facility where God forbid, we never have to use them, but the life rafts that come out of an aircraft are being made in India. Many of the seat harnesses by Colin Aerospace is being made in India. Safran is going to make the engine seals for their engines in India with a $40 million investment. So I think the rapidity and the scale, we, the only thing that we are engaging about is the slope of the curve. Both Salil and I want a much more faster slope of that curve. Faster penetration, greater investment, greater capacities on the ground. And I think the time is ripe in India and the time is now. As far as the point that Bhaskar Bhatji made uh, with regard to facilities and infrastructure, uh, though his point is well made, he has an ask. I have an ask in return. And my ask in return is to him and his group that it's about time that we set up an international civil aviation hub in India. We've had for too long our international civil aviation hub being put, placed with our neighbors on our east, eastern border and our neighbors on our western border. And I think the time has come now to set that civil aviation hub up in India. And for that, we need wide-bodied aircraft. We need to be able to go point to point from India as opposed to the circuitous route that all our passengers are being made to follow. And his group has taken a great step forward in the 470 aircraft order, close to about 50 to 70 aircraft are wide-bodied planes. And I'd urge his compatriots to do the same because there's too much of competition happening on the domestic side. Margins are slim, revenues are slim, but airlines are very com comfortable competing on the domestic side because volatility is low. The minute you go to the international side, your revenues are high. Your cask and your ask. Your cask is limited, your ask is higher. Revenue per aviation square kilometer. But the volatility is greater, much greater. And therefore the time has come for now and I plead that with the airlines. Take risk, face volatility, because India's flag has to fly on the international space. Thank you, sir. I think uh, in your
I would call it short time you have spent with us, you have made sure that we, I mean, walk away feeling motivated, excited, and as you said, uh, ready to make India the hub of the future aviation. Only one suggestion if I can leave with you, you mentioned about these benchmarks in terms of how pe passenger movement is going to take place, how aircraft movement is going to take place. My request to you would be that if you can actually publicize this as an actual data benchmark, I think that will help us convince the rest of the world how we are moving forward in the path to the future. I'm sure it's already on your agenda and would request you to you know, start publishing that information so that we can really talk about this openly as CIA and as business people who have India's interest at heart. Dinesh Ji, if I may respond to that, and you're absolutely right in terms of from a marketing standpoint. But let me also say this, that in my life I have encountered two type of thoughts. One thought where one overcommits but under delivers. I prefer to be the reverse, that I undercommit and I over deliver. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, I would like all of us to give him a big applause in terms of what he is doing for the future of the aviation sector in India. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Dinesh, may I request you to, after the photo op, also hand over a token of appreciation.